we rise to worship God. In the freedom of the truth, we unite for the worship of God. We sing the hymn, Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. church this morning out of lives often full of activity, obligations, commitments, concerns, things we have to do, things we worry about. Slow us down, silence in us any voice but yours, and startle us with your truth, your healing love, your grace in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we say the prayer that Jesus taught us as we say, Our Father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. <coughs> so it's nice to be here in Castle Hill this morning, even if you haven't got a castle or a hill. And uh, last week I was in my old church in London. Uh, where I ministered for 14 years. Uh, and as I came into the church, I heard someone say, it's Martin this morning. And the other one said, Martin who? <laughs> well, I, so I told him, I'm Martin from Colchester. Uh, and I told them Colchester, which was the capital city of Britain, 
before London was. Colter said it has the largest Norman keep in Europe, one and a half times as big as the tiny Tower of London. And uh, I told them how I loved that bit of Colchester along the Balkan Hill by the wall, uh, where you've got the longest, my best preserved stretch of Roman wall that I can think of in, in Britain. Uh, you've got also the best preserved Roman gate in Britain. And of course, there was also, it's along there that we have the, uh, a link with one of our finest pieces of poetry. Does anyone know the children's rhyme that's associated with that particular bit of the wall? Humpty Dumpty, as you see now, someone's up to their culture. <laughs> yes, the story goes, you remember the story, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, all the king's horses and all the king's men. My goodness, what an intellectual congregation you are. <laughs> well, anyway, you, um, Humpty Dumpty was, during the, civil, the English Civil War, Colchester was besieged. And the royalists who were defending put a gun called Humpty Dumpty on, yeah, apparently this is true, good Colchester truth, uh, on top of the wall. And the parliamentary army who were on the Celtic Hill Fort opposite fired their guns across and they knocked that bit of the wall down and the gun collapsed. So Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Colchester. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, the wall went. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. And uh, then I said, but the bit I really like there, and I'm probably the only one who does, is if you go by the roundabout, just a little bit further on, <laughs> there's the remains of a Roman church. And it was built about 1700 years ago. And there's not much left now, but I like to stand there sometimes. <clears throat> and it gives me a bit of a frill. I think I'm standing where Christian worship was offered 1,700 years ago. And it reminds me we're part of that long stretch of history uh, for all those centuries. And now today we carry on uh, that old faith. And now we're going to sing um, our next hymn. Uh, there are unfortunately no hymns about Colchester. I don't think we're going to sing Humpty Dumpty. Um, so we're going to sing Give Me Joy in My Heart, Keep, keep Me Praising. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing. Give me joy in my heart, keep me praising. Give me joy in my heart, I pray. Give me joy in my heart, keep me praising, keep me praising till the end of day. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Give me peace in my heart, keep me resting. Give me peace in my heart, I pray. Give me peace in my heart, keep me praising. Keep me praising till the end of day. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Sing Hosanna to the King 
going to happen with this music do you suddenly an extra verses where you weren't expecting them and this one uh, so now let us pray holy god our creator you are the wellspring of life we turn to you now with our prayers we need you we need your steadfastness your strength and we need the hope that you can bring in difficult times. You've been faithful to us, O oh God, throughout all time, and we call on you today. Guide us in our lives in such a way that we reflect your will and your dreams for our world. You are the living water, the wellspring of life. Pour out your comfort upon us. Pour out your strength upon us. Pour out your healing power upon us. We pray for this congregation at Castle Hill, its members, its friends, anyone here in special need of your love this morning. In a moment of silence, we name any we know in our hearts before you. We pray for this, our country, in this difficult times of COVID, for any who are sick, for those who serve in hospitals or elsewhere, who are facing greater strains and stresses. We remember the people of Afghanistan, remembering especially the women of Afghanistan facing such uncertain futures. Help us, O oh God, to be your hands and feet in this world, extending generosity and kindness and sharing your love and justice with all people. Reach across the barriers that divide us so we may serve one another and build communities of respect, sharing the grace <clears throat> that we have been given. Living God, pour out your spirit until the earth is filled with justice and love. We pray through Jesus Christ, our brother and our saviour. Amen. Our Bible reading this morning comes from Mark's Gospel, Chapter 9, uh, verses 14 to 25. It's entitled, The Healing of a Boy with an Evil Spirit. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and all the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son to you, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into a fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. 
When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and dumb and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the hymn which you've actually sung once before, but you've probably with me, but you've probably forgotten. Uh, praise the source of faith and learning. Praise the source of faith. Oh, 
Well, you were very good when I mentioned Colchester. No one said Ipswich is better. It's a good job I didn't say I'm Martin, who has many relatives around Norwich. That would have produced a different response from you. You notice they lost yesterday, for those of you who follow football, and Ipswich apparently won. Life has been turned upside down. <laughs> but now, if you were asked, what's your favourite Bible verse? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, perhaps. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There are three things that last forever, faith, hope and love, and the greatest of these is love. Let justice roll down like waters, <clears throat> and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Inasmuch as you did it unto the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. Nothing at all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, or a few that might be on my list. Also on my list would be one of those verses we heard in our reading this morning. I believe, help my unbelief. If you're going to understand what faith is, <clears throat> this is one of the great verses. And it comes in a Bible story that I very much like and can associate with that of the man who brings his son to Jesus for healing. I, I identify very readily with this man. Since that day, very many years ago, when my whole life changed and I became a father. And I realized that as we had this tiny child, I had no idea at all what you did with the baby. How did you wash it? How did you stop it crying when it was? How, how did you change it? I've never forgotten that moment when Margaret and I were coming out of Arrow Park Hospital in Birkenhead for the first time with our newborn daughter. And we looked at each other and we said to each other, whatever are we going to do next? And then I discovered the change that comes in you when you have a child, suddenly you love them in the most absurd way. When they smile, no, ever, no other child has ever smiled like that. And when anything happens to them, if they cry, you're worried. If they're hurt, you're concerned. If they're sick, whatever happens, it touches you. And you know, too, you have a huge sense of responsibility. The poor little thing is dependent on you. And because I understand all of that, I can understand very well this man who comes to Jesus with his sick son. A crowd has, as usual, been following Jesus. And here is this father, and he is desperate. His son has some kind of illness. They call it an evil spirit. I think it's probably, today we might say, epilepsy. And he, he has been, he is desperate. He is not there for spiritual advice. He's there because he hopes against hope. That yes, maybe Jesus can heal this child of his. And so he pulls his child through the crowd to the front. And he comes to Jesus and the story pours out in clinical detail. My son has an evil spirit. When it seizes him, it knocks him down. He foams at the mouth and falls to the ground. Bring him to me, says Jesus. And it happens again just in front of him. The boy begins to shake and has some kind of fit. And Jesus begins with a question actually very much like that. A doctor might ask, how long has this been going on? And the man says, it's uh, since childhood. Sometimes he falls into the fire, sometimes he's fallen into water. And then he makes his plea, if you can help us, 
have pity on us. It's not exactly a ringing affirmation, is it? If, if you can help us have pity on us. He has brought his child, I imagine, to all kinds of faith healers, doctors, anyone he thought might help. And always his hopes have been disappointed. And so as he comes to Jesus, it is, if you can help. And Jesus responds, anything is possible to one who believes. And the man has been to enough faith healers to know what he's supposed to say. I believe, he says. And then there's this wonderful moment of honesty. I believe, help my unbelief. Even in this moment, he has to be honest. And Jesus heals the boy. He touches him, the boy goes still. And then Jesus takes him by the hand, lifts him up, dusts him off, pats him on the shoulder and hands him back to his father. And although it's not in the text, I know what happens next. The boy throws his arms around his father and there are tears running down his father's face. And the two go home and to them in that moment everything seems possible. So that's the story and I can empathise with it. But now come back to the key sentence. I believe, help my unbelief. Does anyone know who, do you know who John Calvin was? It's amazing how people don't. John Calvin is the great reformed a reformer from Geneva. He was the one, we are a united reformed church. It is John Calvin above all else who we look to. He is the greatest uh, writer of the Reformation. And uh, he once said, looking at this story, he said, I believe, help my unbelief, these statements may appear to contradict each other. But there is none of us that has not experienced both in themselves. Really? John Calvin said that. Stern, dogmatic, old John Calvin, crusty old John Calvin. Faith and unbelief, there is no one who does not experience both in themselves. Well, he was right. He was a pastor, he knew the human heart. There are, certain, there are different kinds of belief. There are those things you can prove. London, not today Colchester, is the capital of Britain. Ipswich is the county town of Suffolk. Water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. These can be either proved or disproved. They are objective facts. You can know the answer for certain. My daughter gave me a, um, one of these ancestry DNA packs for Christmas. Not sure what she was trying to prove. And it came out, apparently, that I was only 15% British. I don't know why you're laughing, I was mostly French. <laughs> Apparently also I shared 98.9% .9 of my DNA with a chimpanzee. <laughs> well, somewhere there, there are, ob there are objective facts. You can prove them or you can disprove them. They are open to evidence. There are other things, other beliefs that are not like that at all. I grew up in Norfolk, which as Noel Coward said is very flat. And then there was the year we went for the first time on our holidays to the Western Isles of Scotland. And I stood on Pulpit Hill at Oban and I looked out at the Hebrides and I felt there's a wonder to life that Norfolk has not prepared me for. And some of the things I felt there, the wonder of nature, the beauty of it, 
but not in the realm of objective truth. There are all sorts of questions that cannot be settled objectively in facts. When you look at nature, when you listen to music, when you love someone, they are not quantifiable in the same kind of objective way. And most of our deepest beliefs that we have come into this second category. Is God real? Is love the ultimate meaning to life? Was Martin Luther King right when he said the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice? Now, I believe all of those, and I can prove none of them objectively. They are open to doubt. They are open to hesitation. And then life, if you have faith, can sometimes throw things at you that make you wonder whether what you believe is true. John Claypole was a Baptist minister in the States. And then one year, his eight-year-old daughter, Laura, was diagnosed with deadly leukemia. And he was absolutely devastated, and he found himself (coughs) asking that same question that so many people had come to him as a minister with over the years, why? And he wrote a very helpful book called Tracks of a Fellow Sufferer. And he says, through the years, I I learned so much about the questions that life throws at us that it's hard to answer. He said, it's important to throw those questions back to God. There is more faith in honest questioning, he said, than in the act of silent submission. So sometimes religious believers get this all wrong. We confuse faith with objective certainty. We imagine that if you're a a, a godly person, you'll have no unanswered questions. We, We are absolutely, we think we should be absolutely sure that we are right. But if you have no doubts about what you believe, if there are no unanswered questions in your mind, If you say there's no possibility I'm wrong, I'm glad you're laughing. Well, then you're in the same kind of category as those kind of awful people who put explosives on their bodies and blow themselves up in bridges. You're in that same kind of category as the Taliban and all those who think they can kill those who don't agree with them. Faith is not the same as knowing all the answers. And it's certainly not the same as believing we know all the answers. There's something hugely positive in saying, I don't know everything, and some things I'm not certain of. Somehow the word got round that if you have doubts, (coughs) you don't belong in church. Let me tell you, if you've got doubts, bring them here, you'll find plenty of people who've got doubts as well. If you've got unanswered questions, this is the place to come where other people will share them and discuss them and feel with them with you. If you're standing outside because you feel with doubts you don't belong, you could not be more wrong. Douglas Hall, professor of theology in Canada, wrote, faith is not having no doubts, it is trusting God when you have doubts. There are no more important responsibility for the minister, he said, than to say with regularity from the pulpit, doubters are welcome here. Soren Kierkegaard, the 19th century Danish philosopher, helped very many of us when he had the idea of the leap of faith. He says your intellect, your reason, will take you only so far. You will never get to the point when you have answers to all your questions or when there are no 
doubts in your mind. But finally, you must make a leap. You must decide what you're going to trust yourself to and live by it. And that is a leap of faith. Faith is not having, not knowing everything, but despite the doubts and questions we cannot answer, make a commitment of our lives in the belief that that way comes a strength and a purpose for life. The marvel of this story is that the father really didn't have, we'll come back to him now, standing there before Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. He doesn't have very much, does he? He has his partial flimsy faith. He has his mix of belief and unbelief. He has his vacillations and his hesitations and his uncertainty. But then he also has that amazing love for his child that is burning right through him. And he has his honesty. And those are what he has to bring Jesus, his honesty, his love for his child. And it is enough. The marvel of this little story, the one thing that makes me love it so much, is that the story's message is that though the father didn't have much to bring Jesus, it was enough. You don't have to have it figured all out, be all figured out to be a Christian. You don't have to be morally perfect. You don't have to have faith like the rock of Gibraltar. You can bring, well, whatever you have. Bring your questions, bring your doubts, bring your fears, bring your hopes. Bring your honesty, bring your love. And just as with that, Father, it will be enough. I, I've preached on, <coughs> on this text uh, many times over the years because I love it so much and because it is so honest and so straight into where people's lives are and so powerfully speaks the good news of the gospel. And every time I've used this uh, text, I've always finished the sermon with the same hymn. It's an old hymn they used to sing in the Billy Graham revival campaigns. And it seems to me the right and the best, and I think the only way to finish this service. Just as I am, though tossed about, with many a conflict, many a doubt, fighting and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come. And now let us pray. Father God, Father God, we do not have the answer to all our questions. And yet in Jesus we see your love shining and drawing us to him. We know we do not have everything we should have and are not all we should be. And yet we know he will not turn us away. And so may his love fill our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. And the hymn, Just As I Am.
And now, now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen.